Welcome to Palmyra Grace Church's Sermon of the Week. At Palmyra Grace Church, our purpose is to help people pursue a life with God together on mission. To that end, our hope is that each Sunday message influences your Monday and every day of the week. For more information about Palmyra Grace Church, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or find us at palmyragrace.org. Now here's this week's Sermon of the Week. Well, good morning again. If uh, this is your first week joining us, we are in a series for the second part of the summer called Summer Playlist. And uh, this is not going through your playlist or my playlist. This is going through the book of Psalms. And obviously, we're not going to preach through the entire book of Psalms in one summer. But uh, that would be crazy. But what we're doing is we're looking at a few of the Psalms and a few different types of the Psalms. And uh, really just going to this book and recognizing that it is a collection of hymns and poems and songs and prayers, and really it helps us and, and shapes us and forms us as we are worshipers, as we are the people of God. And so uh, I invited you a few weeks back now to read through these 40, uh, over the next 40 days, the book of Psalms. And if you haven't taken that challenge, I'm going to challenge you again. Um, on the table in the back as you leave, there's these little cards that break down the Psalms for you. And, uh, you know, your 40 days could start any day. So don't feel like, you know, you're, you, you already missed the boat. I invite you to do that um, as we're going through these. Today's no different. What, we, what we've been saying about these psalms uh, that we've talked about from the very first week is that, you know, the psalms are open and honest. They're really in them. We find all the intricacies of life, all the ups, all the downs. We find how we can praise God through them. We find about how we can cha be challenged by the people that come against us, uh, by the struggles that we're having, by the great days that we have. There's, song, there's, there's uh, psalms in, in here that uh, invite us to praise. There's psalms that invite us to confess our sins. All of them are in there. All of the realities of what it means to be a human being are found in the psalms. And uh, as we've said since the first week, and then that collides with the reality that there's a holy God and that uh, God invites us to come to him with all of that, and the result is praise. The result is worship, and um, I hope that you've been blessed by this. Today, I trust that God is going to speak to you as well. So as we go to uh, this psalm today, I invite you to pray with me. God, we love you, and we, we come to you now, we come to your word, and I just ask that as we uh, spend time in your word this morning, that uh, you would move and work and have your way. Holy Spirit, I cannot possibly convey what it is that each heart needs to hear on my own, and so I need you to speak through me. We can't hear on our own, and and, and really allow your word to transform us, Lord, without your spirit. So help us to have ears that are open, hearts that are open. Um, move and work and have your way in us today. God, we don't want this to be just another teaching uh, or some guy that studied a passage teaches us more this morning. That's a good thing, but Lord, we really want our lives to be changed in our Sunday to influence our Monday today. So we just give you this time and ask that you would have your way. So when we leave here today, we haven't checked the, the church box. We don't ever want to do that, Lord. Um, we want to encounter your presence and your word and this to inform the way that we live in our workplaces as we go about our day to day. So we give this time now to you with expectation in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I think of August um, and the end of the summer, I think of the county fairs, you know, and all of the little festivals that pop up all over the place. Uh, they were always a really fun thing to do. They actually gave me something finally to do to hang out with my friends, right? Because uh, I grew up in a small town where there was nothing to do. Uh, you guys know how I feel, right? Yeah. And, um, and not only that, but, uh, you know, it was, it was fun to go eat funnel cakes and, and also ride on those rides that they have there. You know, you know what I'm talking about, the fair rides. Uh, 
Everybody loves the fair rides. You know, as I think about them now and I see them as an adult, I think to myself, what was wrong with my parents <laughs> forever allowing me to get on one of those things? I mean, they're death traps, are they not? I mean, they're insane. And, and, and I don't, what's wrong with me forever getting on them in the first place? Um, it's a hard thing for me now that I see them, but one of them in particular has been seared into my mind forever. And not in the good way. Like, it, it haunts my dreams to this day. Um, my grandfather was part of planning the, the fair up in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania. If you know where Ridgeway is, you already get a gold star today. Um, but up in, And so we would go up there every year around this time to ride uh, the fair and go to the fair multiple days, me and my cousins. And this ride uh, still haunts me to my dreams. Now, if you remember Gravitron... What Gravitron is, is it is a ride that basically you get in and you just spin around as fast as you can until you're stuck to the wall like this. You can't even lift. And then the floor drops out. You're like, look at me. I'm stuck to the wall. I can't move, right? Now, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of cool the first time, you know. But after six times <laughs> in a row, everything inside of you is no longer inside of you. I can attest to that myself. It was the Gravitron, the, the spinning, being stuck to the wall is fun, but then the result of that for too long is messy. You know, our lives can sometimes feel like we're stuck on a Gravitron. Yeah? Where you're just spinning. You're so busy. You're so, there's so many things going on in your life. And just emotionally, you have so much to deal with. There's, there's so much pulling you in every different direction. I mean, I would say this, I would say it this way, the centrifugal force, which is what it is that sticks you to the wall, the centrifugal force of life forces everything to the edge. In many ways, us, most of us have lives that are so busy, that are spinning so fast that we feel like we're constantly on the edge. We're stuck to the edge, right? Just ready to hurl. Can I say that in church? I guess I just did. So that's the nicest way I think I could probably have said it. But, you know, that's what happens. This central force of life just kind of pushes us to the edge. And most of us, we're there and we feel stuck. And you know what happens when we live in the gravitron of life, when we are pushed to the edge in every single thing? What ends up being the center of our lives, what ends up being the most important thing in our lives, what ends up being the thing that allows us to feel grounded in our lives, often is interchangeable as we go about our day to day. In fact, the thing that takes the center of our lives is the hottest button issue. Or it's the biggest crisis that we're facing in the moment. It's the last fight we had with that person. Or it's the biggest worry we have with our finances. Whatever it is, that seems to be exchanged out from the edge. And we pull things from the edge and we place them in the center. And if you're like me, you know what this life is like. You know what it's like to live on the gravitron of life. And you know that it's no way to live. Because after six days, days of spinning on the gravitron... You're ready to, well, you know what? When we live life on the edge, we're reactive. We're frazzled. We're anxious. Yeah? Maybe it's just me. You know, what gets in the center, what's most important, is usually not what is most important. But God gives us a way to change that. He gives us an opportunity through our relationship with him to overcome what it means to live on the gravitron of life. And I would just simply say that one of the ways he gives us the opportunity to break free of that cycle is this thing called worship. This thing called praise. The praise of God. It actually, praise helps us. Scripture shows us that praise helps us actually put God in his proper place. It helps us put God back into the center of our lives. I would say it very simply, praise restores his place. It restores his place in the center of our lives. Now, before I go further, I just want to say this to you watching online and you here this morning. Nothing I'm about to say is going to be new to you. 
All right? Nothing I'm going to say for the next 20 minutes is going to be revolutionary in a way in which you're like, oh, I've never heard that before. I'll own that. But what I'm also going to say to you is this. If you live out what I'm about to say to you, it will be revolutionary. If you actually apply what I'm about to say to you, and we together would become a community that lives out what I'm about to say to you, it will be revolutionary. It will change the way that you live. So don't check out just because you've heard the information before, because the information is not what transforms you. Praise restores his place. Jesus talks about this. We know this. I mean, even when we teach people to pray, have you ever learned how to pray using the acts of prayer? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Why? Because when you're dealing with your day-to-day life, when you're going through everything, and then you finally go before a holy God to actually commune with him, to spend time with him, to share your heart and your life with him, we are taught to start with praise. To go before him and say, God, you are holy, you are worthy, you are greater, you are the king of kings, you are the Lord of lords, and I come before you, and I I bow the knee to you, and I I surrender my life to you, Lord. I am not worthy to come come into your presence, but yet, because of your love and your grace and your mercy, you have made me a son, and so I have access to you, Father, and I love you, and I come to you, and I, I magnify your name. Jesus, when he told us how to pray... He said, we are supposed to enter into that time with him and say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We hallow his name. We praise his name. Why? Because it moves us from the gravitron to his presence. It moves us from the center and being on the, from, from the, I mean, from being on the edge to placing him in the center. And we encounter his presence. We encounter the reality of a holy God. And we can start with praise. That's what we were taught to do. One theologian put it this way. In praise, all claims for ourself are given up as the self is seated over to God. Praise itself allows us to shift from a reality from the 99.9% of messages we receive in the world where it's all about us, it's all about where we are, it's all about how we feel, and it allows us to move from that place where all claims to us being the center of our lives are seated over to a holy God. He goes on, he says, this is why in the Psalms the sea roars, the fields exult, the trees sing. This is why in the Psalms, human beings yield themselves fully to God in a dance or in song. The Psalms are about the nature of self-abandonment as the unqualified response of our lives to a holy God. That's what they are. Self-abandonment of all that we are as our unqualified response because we'll never fully be able to praise him the way he deserves. To a holy God. That's what we have in the Psalms, and it restores his place. Praise puts us in a place of humility before God, the only one who deserves our worship. And brothers and sisters, if you want to see transformation in your home, if you want to see transformation in your marriages, if you want to see transformation in your relationships with your kids, if you want to see things change at your work, if you want to see things change at your school, you have to start with that big H word, humility. That I'm not God, he is, and my life needs to be submitted to him. And God invites us to start there with praise. And we can praise God in many ways. We can praise God externally, and we can praise God internally. Some cultures, like the PA Dutch, are really good at praising him internally. Some people, like me, who's, you know, an extrovert, I really like to praise God externally. We just kind of sang, around, sang about how we could do that. I mean, we say we bow our hearts. Now, what does that mean? That's, if I've ever heard a churchy word in my life, we bow our hearts, like how I make my heart bend over, right? But basically what it means when we say we bow our hearts is that we, we, walk, we come before God and we, we surrender, we submit our will to him. Not my will, but yours. The desires inside of me, God, I give to you. But it also says we do it externally. We bend our knee. We get before him. As I started the service today, I read Psalm 47 where it says that every nation, every ruler of every nation will submit to him. He is the king. He is the Lord. 
And when we bend our knees before him, we are saying, God, you are holy. God, you are worthy. God, you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You are my king. Nothing I have, nothing I own, nothing I desire compares to you. And so I come to you and I worship you. And I don't feel fearful about it because you've made a way for me to love you and to know you. But yet I'm still driven to my knees before your presence and your holiness. When's the last time we've done that? But God calls us to worship him that way, externally. And we, we, also, and we, we can raise our hands to the Lord. And I know for some of us that makes us nervous. Or some of us, we think it's showy. But you know why I always raise my hands when I worship the Lord? Because when my two-year-old daughter needed picked up by her daddy, that's how she came to me. And I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, I have never had a Sunday morning where I haven't needed picked up from my daddy. And so I raise my hands to him, and I praise him, and I run to him, and, I hold, and he holds me up when I need it most. We're called to praise this way. We're called to praise for what he's done. And that's fun, and that's easy sometimes. And yet we still don't do it, do we? We want more. We want something else. It's not enough for what he's done. I want you to do this now, but we're called to praise him for what he's done. Praise him for the way he's answered prayers. We don't just do that when the band at church plays the songs that we like. We do it when we, we do that when we recognize his goodness and his love and his mercy. And we also praise him while we wait for him to move. And boy, can I just be honest? That one's a really hard one for me. When he hasn't done it yet. When he hasn't moved yet. When I'm praying and I'm calling out to him and I haven't seen things happen, things aren't going my way, I'm, dealing, I'm in the middle of bad news and brokenness. We're still called to praise. It restores his place. Because at the end of the day, praise is our response to his all-consuming, self-giving, overflowing love. And when we encounter it, really encounter it. The response is praise. The book of Psalms helps us understand this. The book of Psalms helps us respond to him and to place him in, pl in his place. One psalm that does that is Psalm 98, and I invite you to turn there with me this morning. Psalm 98. Psalm 98 is a, a special type of psalm. It's actually one of seven psalms. Now, you can turn there in your YouVersion Bible app. You can turn there in your, uh, your phone or your Bible that you have. I also have the scripture up here on the screen. It's one of seven psalms in the songbook that are called the enthronement psalms. The enthronement psalms. What that means is that they honor God as king. They enthrone him. They recognize that he's on the throne. The Psalms, if you want to know, are Psalm 47. We read that one to begin the service. Psalm 93, 95, 96, 97, 98, and 99. Other than, I don't know what happened with 47 because the rest was real easy to find, right? But, but you know, that, that's the, and they, they enthrone God. What the psalmists are doing for these enthronement psalms is they're calling the congregation. They're calling God's people to look and to acknowledge God as King of kings and Lord of lords, to place him in the center of their lives. Another psalm, Psalm 22, which isn't an enthronement psalm, but it mentions this action upon God's people, says it this way in Psalm 22, 3. It says, God is enthroned on the praises of Israel. Does that mean that God needs us to praise him in order for him to be enthroned, to be placed on the throne? No. But it is that we have an opportunity, I would say an invitation, to praise him so that we can place him on the throne. God is enthroned upon our praises as our king, as our savior, as the center of our lives. And this is what Psalm 98 does. And I invite us now, this morning, to place him back into the center by looking at this psalm. Psalm starts out, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm, have worked salvation for him. Sing. Now, we don't have to sing to praise God, but the Psalms tell us many, many times to sing. 
And some of you, we're glad that you praise God that way. And others of you, we wish you would do it at home. But we're called, we're all called to do it. We're all called to praise him. Because singing to him, raising our voices to him, breaks the power of the life on the edge. It breaks the power of the spinning cycle. It breaks the power of being reactive. It breaks the power of grabbing things from the edge, then pulling them to the center when they're the hot topic or the thing that gets our most attention. It places him in the middle. It reminds us that our life is more about the, than, more about than the moment that we're in. It's about him. And we're invited to sing to him. There's power in our song. It's why our worship has song in it. We're invited to do it. And the writer says, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, when I was a worship leader, I'll admit with you that when I was a worship leader, I loved this verse. Because every time somebody complained to me about all the new songs we were singing, I said, Psalm 98.1 says, sing to the Lord a new song. Truthfully, though, I was... uh, cherry-picking a verse just to work for my own ways. Not that we ever do that in the Christian world, you know. We don't ever just grab a verse and use it the way we want to, but that's because sing to the Lord a new song, it, it actually doesn't mean what, what we think it means. You see, new song, this word new song in Hebrew is, a, is, a, is two words, shir kadesh. And the way that these words are put together, it's very interesting because what the Hebrew is trying to do through this special grammatical construction is to tell us that the writer is actually inviting us to sing a song that anticipates what God is going to do. You see, singing to God a new song isn't singing a new song because you don't know it. It's about singing a new song from the center of your heart because you're invited to praise God in the midst of whatever you're going through, believing that he's going to do something in the future that's going to result in greater praise. That's a new song. I right now, Lord, I am going to praise you. I am going to praise you in the midst of my circumstances. I am going to praise you prior to your response. I'm going to sing a new song because I believe that you are worthy of my praise even in the midst. Brothers and sisters, this is hard for me. Maybe it's hard for you this morning. Maybe there's something that you're asking God to do, something you're asking God to say, something you're at where you're asking God to move. God, I'm going to praise you with a new song. And why? Why can we do that? He goes on, he says, because he's done mar- marvelous things. Because his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him, for himself. God's done this already. And this word salvation, it could be translated, maybe in your Bible it is, it could be translated deliverance. Or it's, it could be translated victory. That God's a God who saves, God's a God who brings deliverance, God who's a God who brings victory, and that's why we praise him. And the original hearers of this would have been singing this, anticipating that God would one day save, that God would one day deliver, that God would one day bring victory. And the reason they did that is because this word salvation in Hebrew is the word Yeshua. It's the word that's translated to the name Joshua. And you know what that word is translated in Greek? Jesus. You can't make this stuff up. You see, they were praising God. They were singing a new song to God. Gosh, it just gives me chills. Every time they sang this song, saying, God is marvelous. He's going to work salvation for the whole world, anticipating the day that Jesus would come and do exactly what they believed he would do. That was their new song. But now we're invited to sing this same song and anticipate the way that through Jesus and the victory that he has given each and every one of us is going to move and work in whatever circumstance we're waiting for. I'm going to sing to him a new song. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, I'm going to have my praises roar. The reason we sing that is because it's a new song, not because it's new to us, but because we're anticipating God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, doing what he said he was going to do. We sing another song here, Waymaker. 
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't hear it, you're working. We worship a God who deserves new songs because he will work salvation for us. The psalmist says, are you able to sing that today? I mean, where is it in your life where you need to sing a new song? Where you've been praying, where you've been seeking, maybe you've given up. Maybe that that hope is actually pushed to the edge and something else has been in the center. Worry, anxiety. Come on, it's normal, right? But God invites us to praise him in advance of the answer to our prayer. He goes on and he says this, the Lord has made his salvation known. That same word again. And he reveals his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Remember, this is before Jesus came. They still believed that this is who God was. And why? Smack dab in the middle of this second, this, this poetry. His love and his faithfulness are the reason why they have this faith. It's the Hebrew word hesed. I've used it and talked about it many times. That is God's love towards us. His steadfast love, some of your Bibles say. His steadfast, his ongoing love, his faithful love, his covenant love, his promised love, his unconditional love. Brothers and sisters, if you know the love of God in Christ Jesus, you never are short of a reason to praise him. That's why. Glad we got one person. We need to work on this. And he invites us, if we encounter that love, if we encounter him this way, the result is praise. The psalmist even tells us how to do that. Yeah, that's pretty great, right? It makes it pretty easy. What does he say? Shout for joy! Shout for joy to the Lord! Why? Because you've encountered his salvation. You've encountered his love. You could sing a new song in the middle of your storm. You could sing out to him and bring him to the center of your life again. Make him Lord over everything. Shout for joy all the earth. I checked the Hebrew. It's all. All the earth. Shout for joy. Burst into jubilant song. Now come on, when's the last time you did that? That's what he's saying. That's, that's the response of a people who have encountered our God. A jubilant song with music and make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with the trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. All of the instruments are fair game. Your voice is fair game. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Now, some of the translations will say shout for joy in the presence of God. Have you ever just got before God's presence and shouted for joy and praised him? When's the last time you've done that? Other psalms invite us to dance before the Lord. And I'll tell you, that's the only place you'll ever see me dancing, is before him. But it invites us, a heart enraptured with the truth of what this psalm is saying, is a heart that can't help but sing, shout, and praise the Lord. Like I said, I'm not telling you something you don't know. But it's got to be something that gets down deep inside of us. If we truly have encountered the love of Jesus, if we truly believe that this is who God is, if he's truly the center of our lives, the response is praise. Before the Lord, before his presence, shouting. It's not something where you're being over the top. It's not something where you're, where you're, you're being showy. No, it's the response of a human being to the love of the Holy One who, did, who created everything. And has given everything in response of his love. And those of you that say, well, I can't do that, Pastor. I'm going to come to your house this year and watch some football with you. Hmm. And, then, and we're going to see. Right? Shout for joy to the Lord. But that's not all. Look what the psalmist says. He says, Even let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live 
live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. He even invites creation itself to sing and to praise. That word resound could be the word thunder. Let the sea thunder. Let the world thunder. Let the world shake at the praise of God. Man, I was reading in my, my, my devotion time this week from the book of Acts when the apostles were arrested before, before the Sanhedrin and they were told no longer to preach the name of Jesus. And after they were released, they went to the congregation that was gathered praying on their behalf. And when they entered the room, they started praying together and they prayed that God would stretch out his hand with signs and wonders and that they would be able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness. And you know what, you know what Luke says in his account from Acts? He says, when they did that, the room that they were in shook. Don't you tell me he can't do that again. Don't you tell me that our God is beyond doing that again. He is looking for people that have put their faith and trust in his salvation. People that are willing to put him into the center of their lives. People who believe that he can do anything he says. And because of his love, our only response is to join with the sea and to thunder and to shake. Regardless, what, what would happen in our, in our community what would happen in our nation if instead of this constant dribble from our newscasters that are suffering fear, 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 death, 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 worry, 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 division, division, division. There was a people of God that gathered together that cried out in praise to the Lord until the foundations of the world shook. Then we would be able to point to the one who is king and on the throne. That's what God is asking us to do. That's what it means to praise. Not to come in here on a Sunday morning and sing four songs with our hands in our pockets. And if you think, we're gonna, if we, if you, think you can come in and on a Sunday morning and sing four songs with our hands in our pockets and then somehow whip up the ability to praise Him in other places, i got to tell you, it ain't going to happen. You practice what you're going to actually proclaim. That's what it's part to be part of the church. That's what it's supposed to be to be a worshiping community. This psalm book wasn't written to individuals. This song book was written to a congregation of people. It was supposed to teach us how to do this. And look, it says the seas does it, the world does it, the rivers do it, the mountains do it. In verse 9, the final verse of this psalm, it's like a culmination. It tells us why we can do this, why we should do this. It says, let them, that's all the world, sing before the Lord. There it is. For he comes, for, because. Why? For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Now that sounds pretty intimidating, right? Ooh, I don't like judging. But for those of us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, for those of us who know that we won't be judged based upon what we did, but we will be judged based upon what he did for us. And that his blood covers every sin. We should cry out for this day. We should cry out for the day that he comes back. That he comes back to judge the earth. That his righteousness and his just, justice would pour out like rivers on this world. That all the things that are broken, that all the diseases, all the problems would be washed away. And that our God, we could trust, will judge everyone with equity and everything will be the way it should be. And all of those who live under this righteous judgment, you know what they will do? They will sing before the Lord. They will praise him. We will fall on our knees, every tongue, every knee, every nation. The book of Revelation gives us, a, gives us a picture of every tribe, every nation before the throne, crying out, holy, 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 worthy is his name. You see, as a praising people, we know because of this verse and because of the, the scriptures that you and I, our lives are always moving towards praise. That's the promised result. That our days, our greatest problem, our deepest needs, our best moments, all of it 
is marching towards an end when our Lord returns and sets up his kingdom. And at one day he returns, and and on that day he returns, he will say, behold, I make all things new. And we will live in a place where our natural response is praise. If you don't like praising, man, you're not going to like heaven. Sorry. This changes things. This changes things for me. Day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour, life by life, I am moving in praise toward praise. That doesn't ignore what's happening. That doesn't ignore my situations. But I have an opportunity to restore his place through my praise. And that changes the way that I live in it. I get off of the gravitron. I get out of living life on the edge. And I place him in the center. And I live from there. This is the type of church that that God is calling us to be. This is the type of church that we need to be. Because this is the type of church that he will use to change the world. So... Where does his place need to be restored for you this week? Are you on the edge somewhere? Is the hot button, the last crisis, the zeros in the checking and savings, have they become the center? I know they're real. I'm not trying to talk down to them. I mean, that's real stuff. But is it become the center as it become the place where you've been consumed. I invite you to praise. To allow your voice and your, your song to testify that that's not king. To enthrone him with your praise back to the place he belongs. Praise him for his love. The psalm says... His steadfast love, his salvation, his deliverance, his victory. Whatever you're going through doesn't change the fact that those things are true. Praise him for it. Praise him for the things that he has done. If you need help this week, here's an assignment. Get into nature. Go for a walk. Some of you, that's really like natural. You love to do that. You, every time you do that, you encounter God. Some of you, <coughs> you'll need bug spray, sunscreen, and to prep for it, right? But get into nature. Other places in scripture, it says, when we see God's nature, when we take time to contemplate God's nature, we see that his greatness and his goodness are self-evident. Get into nature this week and praise him. Take some time today, if that's what it takes. Allow your praises to join with the praises of the world that thunders and claps at the presence of God. Some of us, we need to sing a new song, yeah? We need to praise him now in the middle of our circumstances, not for what he's done, but what we know he's going to do. Praise him ahead of an answered prayer. And why can we do that with faith? Verse 9 tells us. We know the end of the story. Our lives are moving toward praise. We can praise him because regardless of what happens, we know one day the promise is that he's going to return. I need to sing a new song. Do you? It'll change things. This isn't the power of positive thinking. This isn't chicken soup for the soul. This isn't TV preachers that like to sell out stadiums and fleece people for money. This is God's word, and it changes things. It's okay to praise him and believe in him and to trust in him that he will move when we don't see it. 
right? So praise restores this place. I pray, God, let us be a generation that seeks your face. Let's pray. Thanks for joining us for this sermon of the week. If you found this sermon helpful, please share it with a friend in person or on social media. Let us know you were here by going to palmyragrace.org slash I was here. You can also sign up for our news and events at palmyragrace.org slash resources. We hope God spoke to you today and that you can share his good news with someone this week.